Amateur radio direction finding is a sport where you try and find hidden transmitters. Popular in Eastern Europe and China, it operates on several different bands with 80 meters being popular. Today I'll review an 80 meter receiver. It's a kit from CR Kits and I've put it together which I'll show you in a moment and I'll give it an on-air test to find a transmitter that I've hidden. Here's the box, all in Chinese, but it's an R3500D and ARDF.CN and a couple of bags of parts The ferrite rod is there and a pre-round coil, so that bit's already done. More parts and on this half is the printed circuit board. Not sure how I get the lid off with one hand, maybe I'll leverage it with a screwdriver, but anyway that looks like Space for four double A's, and there's some contacts there. Here's the instruction manual that came with the kit, all in Chinese language and pretty limited. However, there is further information available via the CR Kits website. That includes a very comprehensive manual written by Americans and there's also a link to a video, also in English language, that describes the construction. So I'd really recommend reading that manual and watching the video as there are things in the video that aren't in the manual. But you do however get a hard copy circuit diagram which is very handy for fault finding if you need it and also a printed circuit board layout diagram. Just looking at the R3500D on the CR Kits website 39 US dollars and it's an upgraded version uh, covers 3.5 to 3.6 megahertz and there is an English manual modification instructions for the 40 meter band and uh, some other information written by Jack W8TEE and AC8GY for youth on the air. It's got good reviews on Eham and there is a step-by-step -step building video. So, yep, there's uh, an English manual. Um, it's parts list, 40 meter mod. Okay, that looks like the English manual. So, uh, this just goes through the parts, identifying them. Yeah, put the resistors on first. And soldering then then you know it talks about the capacitors transistors IC sockets transformers etc etc so yep yeah, looks like a pretty comprehensive English language manual all the parts are through hole components no surface mount These are all but two resistors mounted on the board. R1 and R13 are mounted last. The 
the instructions say you should mount R13 a bit above the board. The manual says it's 910 ohm. The resistor supplied is 750. But it does say that there will be some variation and you may need to make adjustments to it. So having it offset from the board makes taking it out and making changes easier. Possibly one of the hardest parts of construction is identifying the diodes. They look very, very similar to one another. The instructions say, ask an instructor for help. This was based on it being a group project with supervision. This one says 1043. Nearly all the passive parts are now mounted. Soldered in the two inductors and the two potentiometers. When soldering the coil, I suggest taking it off the ferrite rod, then soldering it to the board. It is polarised. You have to have the red lead, then the black lead, then the sort of light coloured lead in that order. Then only after you've soldered it in, do you put the ferrite rod on and then you use the cable tie to fasten it. One of the difficult things I found with the kit is how do you get into the battery compartment? There's a space there for your fingernail. But it didn't seem to open and I didn't want to press too hard in the fear that I would break it. With the help of a screwdriver, I got it open. Just applied power and I was able to get sound from the headphone. The TDA2822 stage was working, but didn't get any joy from previous stages. Also, C15, I had wired a 470 microfarad capacitor. That is because I was following the parts list, 470 microfarad. Whereas I've got a spare, 4.7 microfarad. Now when I look at the diagram C15 is 4.7 microfarad so a bit of an inconsistency there between the diagram and the parts list so what I can do I can put the 4.7 microfarad in there and I'll keep going with my troubleshooting the other thing I noticed is 150 ohm resistor there, it was getting slightly warm and this was zero volts which it shouldn't be given it's the positive rail. So I might, sh might have short circuited something somewhere. So looking at the alignment instructions, it talks about adjusting T2 to get it on frequency and then later on it talks about T2 to adjust the peak of the tone. I suspect that should be T1 because when we look at the circuit T2 is in the local oscillator portion and T1 is just before the diode mixer and just after the RF stage. Uh, you might also be wanting to peak T CT as well. This does not look very good. It's a solder bridge.
you can tell because if this was meant to connect with this then there wouldn't be this track running along here now the bridge has been removed and we'll now continue with the testing with the solder bridge removed it sounds completely different more like a receiver should haven't yet received any signals but you can hear the volume control is behaving and this is an exciter on 3.68 megahertz it's not as per the instructions 3.58 that was the intention but I want this one to be a little bit higher than the design frequency because the SSB activity on 80 meters here is mostly between 3.6 and 3.7 and I already have this small exciter that I can use for experiments. I do suggest that as well as reading the construction manual also watch the video as there will be some tips in the video not in the manual. I'll have a link to this video in my video description. The instructions do go into some detail in coupling the signal from the signal source into the receiver. I've just got it connected to this wire and in fact this aluminium foil ground mat. And when I adjust this, The receiver is alive. I'm going to assume that clockwise is near high frequency end, which is what I want for 3.68. So I've just adjusted that there. Now this, is, so that that was T2, by the way, the local oscillator. T1 and the frequency is varying but you expect a little bit of pulling. The local oscillator in this operates on half the receive frequency. So this is a 3.5 megahertz receiver. I'm hearing the local oscillator on 1832. I'll just see how low it will go down to. So that's 17.85. And we'll see how high it goes up to. Eighteen seventy-two. As we have a beacon on three six nine nine, and the main part of eighty meters here in Australia stops at three point seven, I think it's reasonable that the receiver stops at eighteen fifty-two. So I've set it just past the maximum. That's clockwise. And we'll just screw the slug in. Now. 
just have a bit of overlap there's 1854 and it's 1830 1812 1803 1768 okay 1768 now let's say 17 yes uh, let's say starts at 1770 double that and that is 3540 so it covers 3540 to 3700 I'm happy with that that's the main part of 80 meters including a bit of digital a bit of SSB and the beacon at the top of the band now if you want to get the receiver to operate on an external antenna I tried connecting it to the telescopic rip I got signals but not particularly good best approach is to just wind a couple of turns around the ferrite rod there The VK2 Beacon in Sydney on 3699. Now to alignment. I've got a frequency range I'm happy with. Now the black inductor, let's peak that. And And now much stronger. Something I should mention, and this will be okay when we put the lid on, but I think this is slightly out of kilter. Um, maybe a hole in a slightly different part of the board might give the rod a little bit better fit. I would have preferred it to be a little bit that way. One thing I found was I had to press the switch on the side a fair bit in to get the micro switch to actuate. The micro switch is important if you want to use the receiver using the telescopic whip antenna. This is the completed R3500D ARDF receiver. This is the tuning control, this is the volume, the headphones plug into here, they're not supplied with the kit but any low impedance stereo headphones will be fine. They actually turn on the receiver. There's a external power socket, maybe it could be used for charging, I haven't tried it. With this button this actuates the micro switch so that switches the receive onto the telescopic antenna rather than just relying on the ferrite rod. 
and in the back is the battery compartment. Batteries do vary in size and I wasn't able to fit the lid back on without forcing anything which might break it but the batteries are firm enough without the lid so that's how I'm going to use it. If you are not familiar with 80 meter ARDF, K0OV, Joe has a bit of a write up on his website. Uh, the salient points include mention of 80 meter ARDF and the benefits of it. Another thing that's mentioned is that the local oscillators on these receivers are often at half the receive frequency, around 1.8 megahertz. That's because you want to lessen interference with other competitors. Um, so you might hear a bit because of the harmonic, but it's less than if you had your local oscillator directly on 3.5, 3.6 megahertz. Anyway, I recommend the website for a bit more information on these receivers and how they work. Here's the transmitter I'm going to test it with. It's very low power, transmits on 3.68 megahertz. I've been told that antennas for this should be as vertical as possible. So, I've just tied a few meters of wire I've got onto a stick and I'll just put it up into a tree somewhere. Most of it's vertical not matched to my very low power transmitter so the range isn't going to be very much maybe only a few tens of meters but still enough to test the receiver like most 80 meter ardf receivers this unit has two receiving modes there's just the ferrite rod which is bi-directional like a figure of eight pattern and the ferrite rod in conjunction with this vertical whip which together gives a cardioid or heart-shaped pattern. That pattern has a bit of a null off the back and that's useful in finding which direction to run to or away from the hidden transmitter. Uh, this is probably about the strongest. This way a null comes back again that way, again a null, and back to a stronger signal. Now with the whip up, press the button and do a 360. That's about the strongest. You can still hear it, or at least I can. But that's about the weakest. So based on that, I will walk towards the forest. Well, my bearing has changed a bit, which means that I'm not too far away from it. But overall I'm getting it in about that direction, or it could be that direction. You can hear the null effect with this, with the button in, it's quieter. Whereas, if I go 180 degrees, from this side, with the button in, it's stronger. Therefore, I'll go in this direction. I'm going a bit nearer to where I think it is and getting still stronger. And 
an even bigger difference between front and back. In fact, it should be now loud enough for you to properly hear it on the camera. So I'll just get the camera and give you a listen. This is just off the ferret rod. See if we can get a null. And that null is straight down there. I'll just ignore what you're hearing now. That's the camera interfering. You might be able to see something in the middle of the screen. That's where the ferret rod was pointing to. I've pulled out and activated the sense antenna. And that's maximum strength. Should be quite strong now for you. And that's minimum strength. I'll just release the button. There we are, it's stronger with the button released. We'll do the same thing before. Here, it's weaker with the button released. So we'll keep going in this direction. And we now have a much stronger signal right in front of me is the transmitter and I'll just press the button even stronger because probably because I'm using the vertical antenna and it's just a couple of meters parallel to the vertical antenna I've got just along a tree anyway I'll just go around like that Now we're really close, not much of a null. But with the button released, look how deep this null is. You can almost not hear it there. Now it's a strong signal. So, just need to take a couple of steps and we can recover the transmitter. So that's my review of the R3500 ARDF kit from CR Kits. Uh, thanks to Adam Rong for the review unit. Details of the kit and the instructions I'll have on a link just in the video description. All the parts were supplied, it was complete, that was fine. It went together reasonably well and the performance seems to be pretty good, at least for the casual transmitter hunter. Only a couple of minor concerns, like the case might have been a bit better. I don't have the battery lid on because I couldn't fit it. But apart from that, fun project to build, works quite well and you can also use it for casual 80 meter SSB and CW listening as well. Uh, you might need to just adjust the frequency a little bit inside. So yeah, I recommend that unit, fun project, and leave your comments if you do build it and have some fun with amateur radio direction finding.